our definition of the definite integral. So let me remind us of that. Right, so this was kind of the culmination of all this work we've been doing with um, approximating rectangles. So I won't go into the details on the notation. We did go over this in class. I'll write it out once, but I won't go through the big explanation. We take, uh, we have a function. Uh, if f is a function defined on the interval from a to b, and delta x is going to be b minus a over n, where n is the uh, is going to be the number of approximating rectangles. We're going to take a limit, but that's what we've been calling it. Um, so we'll just say in delta x is b minus a over n for some positive integer n. Uh, and x sub i is going to be a plus i delta x um, for i equals the numbers 1, 2, 3. It's just going to cycle through the integers from 1 up to n. Then the definite <clears throat> integral of f from a to b is, and here's our definition, we have this new symbol, this integral sign, a to b, f of x, dx, and the definition is just the limit as we make more and more approximating rectangles, uh, and then here is our sum over those rectangles that we were using to approximate, right? This was our construction. Um, so all of this, of course, only makes sense provided the limit exists. If it does, we will call, uh, we will say F is integrable. Right, so there's our definition, which I, I believe we did in class. Um, I do want to point out a couple of things. First of all, I, I use the definition that that uses right endpoints. That's 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 what this construction is right here. We've mentioned many times that uh, it doesn't have to be right endpoints, um, but I'm going to stick with that. It'll make uh, it'll just make our our computations consistent, and it'll be good enough for us. But you might see other definitions out there where it's left endpoints, mid endpoints or really any endpoint in each <clears throat> in each of the little intervals when we divide up uh, uh, this line segment from A to B. Um, okay, so there's our definition, and let's not forget this thing, right? This symbol right here, which is, again, defined this way, represents, if we have a function defined over some interval, it gives us the area between the curve and the x-axis between these two values, right? Um, in other words, this thing is always going to be a number, right? This is a number that we're computing here. That collection of symbols is going to be a number. This is the definite integral. So what I want to add to our understanding in this video, this is all stuff we've done in class, is a few properties. Uh, of the definite integral. And I'm not going to prove any of these. We'll give some light justification based on the geometry. Um, I, I, let me remind us of a couple of other things. We've also said we, we call it the signed area because, for instance, if our function, let's say here's A and here's B, let's say my function does something like this, the area in question would be this region this region, and this region, but the part below the x-axis would be a negative area. So we call it the signed area. Anything below the x-axis is going to give us negative area. Above it's going to give us positive area. Um, um, and that's just due to the definition we have here. Each rectangle's height is given by the function. If this height function, if the function value is negative, 
this will be negative. So those areas will end up being negative. Oh, sorry, I was pointing at stuff you couldn't see. The height function uh, for these rectangles is given by our function. And so if it's negative, uh, the whole area will be negative. So that's our, that's our basic understanding. Let's look at a couple of properties. So we'll have properties of the definite integral. Right. And one of the big ways we're going to use these properties is really as uh, is to simplify problems. If we notice something in a problem, this might these properties might save us some work. For instance, it's similar to if you notice a function is an even function and you graph one side of it, you already know what the other side looks like. So these are similar kinds of properties that if we notice them, they can save us some work. So our first property has to do with switching the order of integration, right? These were the limits of integration we had in our definition uh, from A to B. I'm going to switch it to B to A. And what ends up happening is you end up with the opposite of what you got if you did it in the original order, right? So here was our original we've switched the order, we get the opposite of the original, right? So if the original was positive, it'll be negative, and if it's negative, it will be positive. Um, I think the easiest way to understand that, or just remember that, is, uh, is just to look at this definition. It switches the order of B minus A. This becomes A minus B, and when we switch the order of a, of a uh, subtraction problem, we always <clears throat> pick up a negative sign. And so... Um, it'll switch the sign of the whole limit, right? At each sum, we'll get a negative sign that, or lose a negative sign, whatever the case may be. So we get the opposite uh, of the original. Um, we could also think of it in terms of our uh, the exercise we did in class where we show that the area under a velocity curve is a distance. We're now moving backwards, and our distances are going to have a direction, a positive and a negative. So we're reversing the distance, reversing the direction. We're getting an opposite sign there as well. Uh, all right, another one. This one's pretty easy to see. Now, both limits are the same. We end up with zero, right? Algebraically, you can see that in the formula, b minus a, if a is equal, to, if b is equal to a, we have a minus a, each delta x is zero. Every time we, we, we compute these sums, we're getting zero, so the limit is going to be zero. Geometrically, it's just the area of a single line. There's no region. And, an, and a line will have an area of zero. So that's where that property comes from. We'll take the integral from A to B. C is just going to be some constant. All right. So now this is the integral over a constant function. Let me draw a little picture of this. Here's A, here's B. Here's our constant function. Let's call this C. Well, the area in question now is just a rectangle. The distance between these two points is b minus a. The height here is just the value of the function c. So the area of this rectangle is b minus a times c. All right. So that's an easy one to compute. We don't need we don't need to work out any of the limits. We know if it's a constant function how it's going to look. Um, all right. Suppose we create a new function by adding or subtracting uh, two functions together. All right. So I want to think geometrically and algebraically about this. So first, algebraically, well, algebraically, let me just write what the result is and then we'll talk about it. So what we can do is take each integral separately and then add or subtract the two integrals together, right? So this side is we're creating a new function by adding or subtracting two functions and taking the integral of this new function. Here we do the two integrals of the original function separately and then add or subtract those two integrals together, okay? So algebraically, <clears throat> excuse me, this just comes from the fact that when we're adding functions in a summation, one of our summation rules was that we could split the summation across two functions, and then we get the same rule for limits. So I'll let you work out the details, but it, it works out pretty similarly from our summation rules and our limit laws that we can split these two things up. Uh, geometrically, it's a, it's a little trickier to draw, but suppose I have a function, 
I'll try to make them relatively simple. Um, let's say I have a function f and a function, I don't know, g could do something like this. If I created the function f plus g, each value, let's start at zero, I'm going to take the value of f and the value of g and add them together. So if f was down here and then I add g to it, I end up with something up there. At a point out here, I take the value of f and the value of g and add them together. So I'm going to get some very high point, right? So I'm not going to be able to draw this super well. But at each point, part of the height is the value of f and part of the height is the value of g, right? And we've added the two of them together. Well, if we think about approximating rectangles, what that means is we're taking the, the approximating area of f and the approximating area of g and just adding them together. So we're really stacking these two areas on top of each other to get this area. And so that's a geometric way to think about that. Just a couple of more. Actually, let's just do one more, uh, two more for this video, yeah. All right, so now we have, we'll take C as a constant again. And now we take a function and multiply it by a constant. So if here's F, let's say I multiply it by some number, maybe it's a number bigger than one, and so it stretches the function, right? I didn't do a, a, a great job of it, but let's say maybe I doubled it at each point. Right, so each point is twice as high, that's going to make the area twice as big. In other words, we can just take the original area under the graph of f and multiply it by a constant. So those constants slide out. Right, and again, there's an algebraic way to think about this where we know from summations if we multiply by a constant, it can slide out in front of the sum, and we know from a limit. Our limit law is that a constant can come out, slide out in front of a limit. And so that also tells us how that, that works algebraically. All right. And the final property that we're going to talk about in this video looks like this. A, C, F of X, DX, plus C, B, F of X, DX is equal to A to B, F of X, DX. Okay, so notice what happens here. We have these two limits of integration are the same, the upper limit from one, the lower limit from the other. We can remove this one and just end up with one big integral. Okay, so let me draw a picture of this. The easiest way to see this is when C is between A and B. So here's my function F. So I'm just gonna imagine dividing this into two regions. Let's call this region one this region two, and then the whole thing will be region three, right? So as I've drawn it here, this is just saying if you add this area, the integral from A to C, plus the integral from C to B, you end up with A to B, right? Integral from A to C is region one, region two, you end up with region three, the combination of both of them. Let's do one example where it's not in the easy order. What if I switch this to write b here and c here because nothing in this rule says c has to be in between a to c is then region three right this this integral is region three c to b is region two but done backwards so it's going to be a minus region two then we have a to b which is now region one and we're looking at this so the area of the whole thing minus the area of the top is equal to the area down here, All right? So that's obviously not every possible combination, but it gives you an idea of how this works out. No matter how you try to conspire these things and work them out, it will, it will make sense in terms of areas, okay? And that's what our, there's where our rule is. Okay, so there are the properties for this video. Um, and that is it for now.